Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Aha, uh -huh, I see some people are already here. Thank you so much for being here this afternoon. We're going to get started in a couple of minutes for Lunch and Learn. We're just gonna give a couple of moments for other folks to join and we'll get started about two minutes after the hour. All right, I see some more folks joining us. Thank you so much for being here. Again, we'll get started in about one minute, a couple minutes after the hour. We're just allowing some folks to join us. Thank you for your patience. Okay, we're going to give it about 30 more seconds to allow folks to join. Thank you so much for those of you who are already here. We're going to get started in just a couple of moments. Alrighty. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Emily Levine, and I am the manager of adult services for programs and outreach at the Enoch Rapri Library. Thank you so very much for joining us for the June edition of uh, Lunch and Learn. Um, today, for the June edition of Lunch and Learn, African American Land Conservation and Preservation in partnership with the Maryland State Archives and the Maryland Four Centuries Project. Thank you so much for being here. I'm now going to turn it over to Bert to introduce today's speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Emily, and welcome everyone uh, to our Lunch and Learn lecture at the midpoint of 2023. We and our partners, the Maryland State Archives and the Amy Craft, Baltimore's very busy and efficient library system, look forward to these lectures that feature the best speakers researching and interpreting Maryland's rich history, now going on 400 years. As many of you may have already noticed, our Maryland's Four Centuries Project is highlighting that history every Monday on Facebook and Instagram. Our Maryland First posts point to people, places, events, documents and objects that are not only unique to this state, but also to the evolution of the whole nation. These many national firsts illustrate how important this small state has been to the entire nation. Indeed, we have a big history. We look forward to these individual pieces, forming a digital picture of our state as a part of the U.S. 250th anniversary in 2026. You can follow our Maryland First each Monday on our Maryland 400 Facebook page. Today's lecture presents one of the largely untold stories that deserves a lot more attention. Despite the restrictions in some other states, we can highlight the important role of African Americans in the history and culture of the Chesapeake community. And I applaud the governor as a champion of that diversity. I have two important learning experiences of my own, one almost half a century ago and another within the last two years. As a Maryland public television producer in the early 1970s, I covered the annual Chesapeake Appreciation Day skipjack races. I spent a wonderful day on board the old Claude Summers skipjack with African-American skipper Thompson Wallace and his family. We also discovered that Black-owned oyster boats were rare in the Waterman's community. You can imagine how shocked and saddened we all were 
years later when we heard the news that Mr. Wallace and members of his family were lost in a severe bay storm in 1977. My other more recent encounter was a visit to the Water's Edge Museum in Oxford, Maryland. We toured the museum with members of an African-American family that has worked the waters around Oxford and Talbot County for several generations. Their story is also filled with racial struggles, but the lively and engaging portraits of that community on the museum walls document a rich African-American tradition now available for all to see. Now, our speaker today has been devoted to those traditions that paint a picture of Chesapeake history, as he says, through ebony eyes. Vince Leggett has worked tirelessly to fill an important and neglected gap in our knowledge of our Great Bay's long history and culture. You will soon understand why the governor of Maryland has appointed Mr. Leggett the honorary admiral of the Chesapeake. So today, our admiral will go to the bay's edges and show how some beaches in Anne Arundel County were long recreation and entertainment havens for African Americans during the Jim Crow era. Please join me in welcoming Vince Leggett. Well, thank you, Bert, for that uh, warm introduction and uh, the Claude Summers and the story and the legacy of Thompson Wallace is one that I know well and uh, his son, uh, Reverend Wallace from on the Eastern Shore and myself have spent a lot of time together. And even in my book, The Chesapeake Bay Through Ebony Eyes, uh, I devote you know, some columns and words to the legacy of black watermen, black captains, and particularly remembrances of uh, Thompson Wallace, uh, as you say, in 1970. Seven. It was eight members on the boat, sons, nephews home on military leave and and the legacy, but also the skipjack races. Again, part of Blacks of the Chesapeake is trying to bring to light stories that were untold, erased, or sitting in the bottom of the Chesapeake Bay in David Jones' locker. And we're trying to do is bring these stories to light and to the forefront, again, to dispel the myth that Blacks, Browns, people of color don't care about the environment. Every day I wake up, I'm dedicated to trying to smash that myth because African Americans have been involved in all aspects of the maritime and seafood processing industry, but really have not receive the recognition I think is due. The topic today is African-American land conservation and heritage preservation. And our marquee project is centered around cars and sparrows beaches in Annapolis, Maryland, where the Severn River and the Chesapeake Bay intersect. From that latitude and longitude, the story of music in America can be told from those shores, from blues and jazz and gospel and R&B all the way up to the rockers. And many people might not know that even James Brown has been the most sampled artist of many contemporary musicians and particularly the rappers. Uh, James Brown has sampled more than any other rapper uh, that's ever took the stage or held a microphone. I worked in 2019 with Fox News out of Washington, D.C., uh, Channel 5, to do a cover story talking about remembering the beaches. And so to maximize our time today, I'm going to ask Sean if he could pull up this cover story just to give some context on the beaches. 
Notebook won big at last night's Oscar, scoring Best Picture. But before it was big, it was already shedding light on the adversities that African Americans faced during the restrictive era of segregation and Jim Crow. In Maryland, beaches like Ocean City and Sandy Point were for whites only. But a set of African American sisters turned beachfront land in Annapolis into more than just a listing in the Green Book which was a real thing. They made it a safe retreat for black Americans to thrive. When I was growing up, Ocean City was segregated. I remember being in the water and there was a rope there with balls on it and you knew that you couldn't go beyond the rope because on the other side of the rope was the white area and it was just something about whether it's the water fountains the beach the playgrounds the libraries the schools there's something very uh, humiliating about seeing the white only sign or the colored only sign i was probably eight years old um I didn't know that I couldn't go to these other places. And there was a recent movie called The Green Book that kind of outlined a lot of these different facilities where it was safe for people of color to go. Well, Cars and Sparrows Beach were one of those places. Here was the 1930s. You had two African-American females that owned acreage on the Chesapeake Bay. It was a source of confidence and empowerment. It's history that many of our people haven't seen. To see African Americans prevailing against all odds, uh, being educated, business people, hiring people, uh, adding to the tax rolls. They hired many of the local school teachers during this period of segregation where colored teachers were paid less than white teachers. Cars Beach was not a confined environment, so it had the the air of a festival so people felt free the slogan was uh, black feet and white sand i mean that was just so empowering and no one could tell you to sit down or stand up you could just come out and enjoy the chesapeake bay enjoy the music enjoy the food enjoy the fellowship some of the entertainers that came to cars beach at that time were like count basie ella fitzgerald Chick Webb, Duke Ellington, Bray Charles, James Brown, Sarah Vaughn. Just to see people of color in charge running something was just very empowering to a downtrodden people. I do feel a little sad that some of these beaches no longer exist, and I understand um, why, because when integration came, we decided to test all the things that we couldn't go to. They played such an important role and as long as we don't forget that they existed we've had some hard times but we are survivors even with all of those obstacles as a community african americans found ways to prevail how to strive how to empower others how to maximize opportunity and so i think that message is just as relevant today as it was in the 30s the 40s the 50s and the 60s Thank you, Sean, for uh, sharing that clip. And I hope that our viewing and listening audience uh, receive a lot more insight into what it was like in the 1920s, the 1930s. And again, with state-sponsored segregation. But as this cover story indicated, in 1902, Mr. Fred Carr uh, amassed 180 acres on the Chesapeake Bay, which was phenomenal. And in the 1920s, they began to have church groups and picnics, and they built log cabins, and they also grew produce on their 180 acres, tobacco. But what I found equally as fascinating Mr. Fred Carr was selling sand off of that beach for 10 cents a ton. Can you just imagine the uh, ingenuity that these individuals had? He had four daughters and two of them opened up two of the most fabulous beaches on the Chesapeake Bay, Carr's Beach and Sparrow's Beach. 
They were independently owned and operated. There was a fence that ran between the two businesses. The fence even extended out into the water. But when it came to bringing major shows and entertainment to the beaches, they had James Brown and Sarah Vaughn's, but also had the John Lee Hookers and the Muddy Waters and the Temptations and Smokey Robinson and on and on. And this whole network was called the Chitlin Circuit, which is a derivative of soul food back from the period of enslavement plantation light. Because again, African Americans have been always resilient. And as they say, uh, one person's throwaway is another person's treasure. But the Chesapeake Bay provided uh, nutri nutritional food. Uh, you lived on the water's edge because during this period, limited resource, poor people, blacks and browns lived on the water's edge. It was high reeds and high mosquitoes. Plus, you could not grow tobacco in it. And so the more resource people lived up on the hill. But the black people, the coloreds, the Negroes, they were in the bottoms, in the hollows, on the necks, on the creeks. But what that did do was give them access to the waterways. In our book, The Chesapeake Bay Through Ebony Eyes, again, what we try to portray is the many roles that African-Americans have played on the bay. So often, if you go to any college or university or public library in the region and pick up books that say Chesapeake Bay, it's very seldom you'll see people of color. If they are portrayed, if we are portrayed, the caption says crab picker and oyster shucker. And I admit that, yes, in many cases, African-Americans served as the backbone of the maritime and seafood processing industry. What the publications don't show is that African-Americans were boat builders and sail makers. And as Bert said, captains of skipjacks and bug eyes and schooners and been involved in all aspects of the industry. I don't know I mean, how many of my viewing and listening audiences have crossed the Chesapeake Bay going eastbound or westbound and you see these big tankers out in the middle of the bay lit up like battleships. Well, whenever a foreign vessel or a vessel with a foreign flag comes onto the Chesapeake Bay, whether it's through Cape Charles and Cape Henry in Virginia, Newport News, Hampton Roads, those kind of names might ring a bell, where the Atlantic Ocean and the Chesapeake comes together or comes from the upper part of the bay, the Harvard of Grace, Susquehanna River, the Chesapeake and Delaware Canal, this 200-mile stretch of waterway the uh, pilot, not airplane pilot, boat pilot, has to go up to the bridge. They go out on a small launch boat, crawl up through on a, a rope ladder and take the helm and they have to guide those international ships to safe dockage on the bay. Well, African-Americans have also been boat pilots and as I work with young people and not so young people, golden seniors, just to show the length and breadth and the depth that African Americans have been involved from one guy on a little 12 foot skiff with 30 foot oyster tongs squeezing together like scissors, bringing up gold oysters from the Chesapeake Bay all the way up to the Bay Pilots, and again, many of them have graduated from the Merchant Seaman Academy, the Coast Guard Academy, and just look at, we talk about STEM and STEAM, science, technology, art, mathematics, engineering, to really show young people the wide array. One of the things that Bert did not say in his introduction, I guess he left a couple of things for me to say is, I describe myself as a country boy from East Baltimore. And once you finish snickering and laughing and, and eyeball rolling, say there's nothing country in East Baltimore, here I am. And all that's left of me, I know I look pretty good, but I'm closer to 70 than 60. Matter of fact, June 26th, I'll turn 70 years old. 
But what I do say is that to look at where a downtrodden people have come from to be land owners and developers and realtors and educators. And so this is really the marquee part of our work. Yes, the Library of Congress has recognized us. Yes, we are working with Ina Pratt Free Library, Digital Maryland Online in conjunction with the Maryland State Archives where we have over 400 linear feet of material records, playbills, oral histories, VHS tapes, research tapes. We've done over 60 ethnographic studies around the Chesapeake Bay looking at the people and the places and the implements they use for working the bay, the structures that they lived on and built. And I'm glad that, again, Bert uh, mentioned Bellevue and Oxford on the uh, eastern shore, Talbot County. You may have heard of the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum, but some may not have heard of Bellevue, but this was an African-American enclave where the owners own seafood processing plants. And even in St. Michael's themselves, Coburn and Jewett in the 1930s and 40s was the largest employer in Talbot County and St. Michael's, and he specialized in crabs. The picture I'm trying to point, ladies and gentlemen, and boys and girls, is that African Americans have been involved in all aspects of the maritime and seafood industry. And that is the purpose of Blacks of the Chesapeake to amplify and bring to light, bring to screen, bring to ear this remarkable story. Most times people want to say, well, Vince said all sounds good. What have you done lately? Well, one thing I had asked uh, Emily to put in the chat on June 3rd, the Washington Post uh, did a story looking at cars, spirals, and Elktonia Beach. And just yesterday in the Washington Post Metro section above the fold is a story about these black beaches and the efforts that myself and the city of Annapolis, the state of Maryland, Anne Arundel County, the Chesapeake Conservation Fund, the uh, Conservation Fund itself, we cobbled together over $6 million to buy the last five acres of this 180 acres I told you all that Fred Carr amassed in 1902. So 175 of the acres have been repurposed into 400 unit condominiums and marinas, but also a wastewater treatment plant. And part of my work in lectures around environmental justice and equal justice under the law. And what the research shows is that many times if you're a limited resource person, doesn't matter the color, but it is more predominant in black and brown and indigenous communities that nuisance facilities will be housed in your neighborhoods, the landfills, the transfer stations. Uh, water treatment plants and so forth, a lot of noxious facilities that burden uh, people already on fragile uh, health conditions and pre-existing conditions. And so that's another big part of our work. What I also uh, have been involved in is again, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tudman. Most people know about the latter parts of their life, but both of them were born on the Chesapeake Bay Harriet Tudman in Dorchester County, Frederick Douglass in Talbot County, and they grew up with salt water running through their veins. And they are the bookends of Blacks of the Chesapeake. And so again, this is part of the work that we do. Uh, I've asked Emily also to put our website uh, in the chat where we uh, have news stories, cover stories, uh, historical programs, what's coming up next. We're also doing a program to now purchase another piece of property adjacent to the five acres we just purchased for $7 million, $6.4 million. I'll round up to seven. Again, to create an heritage park that can tell the story of Cars Beach, Altonia Beach, Sparrows Beach, but we're also doing another project 
in southern Anne Arundel County in the Shady Side area, another community called Columbia Beach. But again, I look at this whole stretch, uh, this 200 mile stretch along the Chesapeake Bay, but this greater Annapolis area, I call the Black Coast of the Chesapeake Bay. You also have Highland Beach and Oyster Harbor and Arundel on the Bay where again, traditional African-American stories with rich history and rich legacy. So what I'm gonna do right now is just pause Take a deep breath. Uh, this is Lunch and Learn. I'm going to take a little swig of my Golden Peak Real Iced Tea. I'm going to ask uh, Emily to come in and tag team. And my joy, I hope you can tell I can talk about the subject for hours. I have a passion for it. But my love and joy is interacting with the audience. And so I'm going to ask Emily to join in tag team with me. We're going to open up the chat line, open up the Zoom line. And again, there may be some questions that people might want to hear more about. But equally important, you might have a view different than mine. And it's all good. Let's chop it up. So Emily, can you come in and uh, you work the control dials and just see who's out there in Zoom land? Sure. Um, so I'm waiting for some questions to come in. We have a couple of comments here from Facebook saying, thank you, Vin, so much. You are so inspiring. Um, all this information is so is very, very important. Um, one of the questions that I have um, to get us kicked off is how, I know that you had shared a little bit about the work that you're currently doing, and I shared um, both of those links in the chat, both your website and the Washington Post article. But can you talk a little bit about how people um, through your work might, how they could get involved if they were interested in also uh, giving back and um, being connected with you? Well, one of the things that we have been involved in this Blacks of the Chesapeake project for over 30 years now, and a big part of it is uh, feet on the ground, boots on the ground, feet in the creek to actually work directly in communities. And if individuals know of communities that have rich histories and heritage, rich African-American history and heritage, where if the story has been erased or under told, uh, you could definitely reach out through us through our various media platforms and, and our www's and emails and all of that and uh, share that information with us. We may have the Rosetta Stone sitting in our 30-year local legacy collection that's been deemed such by the Library of Congress. And it might just be a name through genealogy that may be within our files and collections. But also, we do a lot of public programming. We do a lot of partnering with the federal agencies. We've worked with the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. We're currently doing work with the National Park Service, Department of Natural Resource Environment, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, among others. And so we're always looking for opportunities through strategic alliances and partnerships to uh, combine our efforts. One of the things I will share with your viewing and listening audience is that when it comes to community-based organizations, NGOs, non-government organizations, that capacity building is an ongoing challenge. Many people have stories, but do they have the resources to document those stories, research those stories, and share them out to the public? And so we also serve as a clearinghouse, the Blacks of the Chesapeake, serves as a clearinghouse that if you have unique histories or unique stories and you need a platform to help amplify those, we work with PBS. We recently did two documentary films, one on Harriet Tubman called Visions of Harriet, another on Frederick Douglass becoming Frederick Douglass. And Bert talked about the water's edge that we had recently done around black watermen and watermen communities. This is what I say to people. I can't tell everyone's story. I can't go to every village and hamlet. But what we do hope is to inspire you to tell your story, tell your community story, and we can serve as a resource to help you do that. Hmm. Great. Um, so we do have quite a few questions that came through. Thank you all so much for fielding those. Um, so 
Vince, Tim is asking to, if you could clarify that there were two beaches, the cars and the sparrows that, that were sisters. Is that correct? Can you clarify yes. for him? Okay. Yes. Perfect. Yep. They were two, the, uh, Mr. Fred Carr had four daughters and all four of them went into business, but Florence Carr Sparrow and Elizabeth Carr Smith brought out the other two sisters and created these beaches that ran from the 1930s up until the mid 60s when integration and desegregation took place. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he's also asking um, if the music venue was at the cars mainly and if that's where Hoppy Adams was based. Yes, Hoppy Adams that in the 1950s, Baltimore businessman Little Willie Adams from Baltimore brought into and eventually controlled these two beasts from the late 50s up into the mid 60s. And he invested in a 6,000 seat pavilion, upgraded facilities, board and slot machines, boardwalks, midways. But also they teamed up with a Jewish a uh, merchant marine that owned a radio station in Annapolis, WANN 1190 AM, 50,000 watts of power. And that signal reached to Pennsylvania, West Virginia, North Carolina, as far west as Ohio. And he recruited Charles Hoppy Adams. And his tagline was, tonight, tonight, tonight. And every Sunday afternoon, he had a program called Bandstand on the Bay. And again, uh, just a remarkable person. So, yes, Tim and others, it was Hoppy Adams tonight, tonight, tonight on WANN 1190 on your AM dial, 50,000 watts of power. Wow, that's very exciting. Um, we have... Uh, a whole bunch of comments rolling in. Um, Jody, who is uh, another Enoch Pratt employee, um, is saying if folks are interested in the Digital Maryland collection, that there uh, she posted a link. I can share that out. Jody, if you could just chat that to me in our in our work email so I can share that out with our viewership, that would be great. Um, Hannah is saying, um, louding your message, saying yes, we must explore all um, and talk about all of our histories of all communities. Explore, explore, explore. Document, 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 which is really great. And our digital Maryland collection online really does that. So Jody, if you could just share that um, chat with me on, on Gmail, then I'll send it out to all of uh, the folks that are, are viewing right now. Um, Adib is asking on YouTube, Vince, could you please expand on the print media resources that you mentioned being located in various sites? Could you talk about what kind of media is where and what specific locations that media is located at? Right. The Maryland Archives uh, is our primary partner with our 400 linear feet collection. They are doing inventory, cataloging, and digitizing. Uh, some of our VHS and cassette materials are being digitized through another one of our partners, John Hopkins University Archives. And so, again, a, a big core of it is at Rao Boulevard, the Hall of Records, Maryland State Archives, is where the processing is taking place. And it's a multi-year effort, and it's been going on for the last three years. We hire and recruit volunteers and, and interns, high school, all the way up to postdoctorate. So again, we're always looking at people that can help expedite the processing. One of the things I would also share with Habib is that through working with Digital Maryland Online and working with Corey Lewis and Megan and Elaine, the he, chief uh, archivist now, by me being a community historian, my background, academic background is in urban planning and community development. Uh, but also I have a background in K-16 education. And so I always thought that the sweet spot of the Blacks of the Chesapeake was our more than 40,000 photographs. 
And but when the archive staff came to my various locations, because I had materials at the in-laws house, the outlaws house, under basements, in attics, between mattresses, and we began to amass it in the one central location for processing, a couple of things came out of this vulnerability assessment. One was for a community-based organization uh, that did not have best practices with conservation science, our stuff was not in humidifier, typically controlled spaces. They found a few watermarks on the box, but the photographs didn't melt. They didn't stick together. But what they did say was the magnetic transfer material, the VHSs, the cassette tapes, uh, it might be someone this viewing audience that's around my age. I remember having the cassette tapes where I would stick a pencil in it, trying to turn the spool around because it got twisted up. It was one of my favorite songs or VHS tapes from Bam Bam and Pebbles at the family reunion. They said those were the most vulnerable things because if the photos didn't melt after 30 years, they thought that now we could get it in the proper conservation, packaging, and so forth. So again, you can tell that person, they can reach out to me or Corey Lewis or uh, Megan at the Maryland Archives would be a good place to start if you have further interest in partnering, collaborating, or again, just trying to help us amplify this story. Hmm. Amazing. Um, again, more comments coming in about your um, willingness to collaborate and work with the community. Um, Jerry is asking, uh, can you speak a little bit more about African Americans in Baltimore and how and where they access the Bay from the city and also how and where they could work in the Bay from the city? One thing I would say is, I mean, Fells Point, uh, Canton, the Outer Harbor. I mean, uh, that's where Frederick Douglass, when he escaped from the Maryland Eastern Shore, Talbot County, Wild Plantation, they came to Fells Point. Baltimore, Maryland had more free blacks than any other state in the union. As most of your audience knows, Maryland never succeeded from the union, but it was slave and free. And so the maritime trades were everything traveled by water. So boat caulkers, shipwrights, handlers, peddlers, hucksters, uh, all worked out of the Fellows Point area. We've worked with the Living Classroom Foundation that put the, in Baltimore, Fellows Point, that put together the Isaac Myers, Frederick Douglass Maritime Museum and Park. And Isaac Myers in the 1870s had the Chesapeake Bay Dry Dock and Shipbuilding Company right in Fells Point. So I would say the greater Fells Point area, but then all along the middle branch, whether it's West Point, Mount Winers, Curtis Bay, Cherry Hill. Again, as I said in my opening statement, it was poor black, brown, and limited resource people that lived on the water's edge. We didn't have water and uh, sewer, People were dumping everything. I don't know. I grew up in Baltimore, 1953, and my uncles worked as longshoremen and stevedores. And when the banana boats came in from Barbados, uh, our four people were on those boats. They worked the docks. When McCormick Spice and Domino Sugar would bring spices from around the world, we worked there again on the water's edge, on the boats, and also in military. That the United States Navy was the first integrated branch of American Armed Services, and more than 25% of the seamen were people of color. And so again, it was a rich maritime history in Baltimore. Amazing. Um... Just responding to some folks' comments here. Um, Hannah Lane says, um, this is a wonderful thing. Congratulations on all of the work that you've done on this project. 
She's also asking, what are some of the future directions and or plans for the recently purchased beach land? Do you have any plans for, for that space? Yes, I have more plans than dollars, and hopefully this platform will help shake the tree. So this is what I would say is that we have preserved the five acres, and that was five out of the initial 180. Do the math. The idea is to create a heritage park with trails and signage and gazebos and pavilions and music turned up at the proper decibels. I mean, I'm not going to try to put 10,000 people on five acres. I'll have Smokey Robinson perform at Merlin Hall or the Navy Marine Corps Stadium, but Smokey will come down and tell a few stories and cut a ribbon. And so but also put together a first class visitor center as well as the home for the blacks of the Chesapeake. Because this is one thing I do say is that as an African American that has been involved in preserving history and heritage, we have the ability to tell our own story. That's part of the challenge that I've found. But I've always been collaborative in nature. We can't do it on our own. And so that's the whole vision to have it as an educational center. And we call it the echo center, education, cultural, uh, ocean ways. We're teaming with a group called uh, Blacks in the Marine Science. This is seven PhD postdoctorates out of Hampton University and their research is eDNA. Well, when I met with them, I had to step away for a minute to wash my hands to Google what is eDNA. Well, it turned out to be environmental DNA and their specialty is doing water samples and they can tell what people, what plants, what fish have interacted with that water. And they have amassed grants from Science Foundation, the Packet Foundation, but they also team with Blacks of the Chesapeake to merge African-American storytelling with eDNA. And they said that's going to blow the socks off of the industry. So stand down, stand by, get ready. Uh, and so we're already teaming, uh, bringing these concepts together. It's high interest. And again, we're looking for other people that may have uh, uh, interest in that space. And we'll be producing educational materials, guides to catalogs. I get calls all around the world with how did you pull it off, Mr. Vincent? Uh, mm -hmm. In January, my wife and myself flew to Dakar, Senegal, Gory Island, Door of No Return, just looking at the transatlantic slave trade and sites of memory through UNESCO and through the State Department. And they said to me, well, Mr. Leggett, you are a cultural attache. Well, I had to excuse myself again and go wash my hands and say, what is a cultural attache? Well, I'm it. <laughs> So basically, Hannah, what Vince is saying is that he has many, many plans. We're very excited to see how they manifest. Um, we have a gentleman named Peter who is asking um, if there are any resources or recommended places to seek actual historic photos of Black watermen at work in the Chesapeake. And he's asking because um, he's part of a community organization, and sorry if I butcher this, the Bon Secours Community Works in West Baltimore. Um, they're working to actualize a desire of a now uh, deceased resident to install a mural of black watermen of the Chesapeake overlooking a park. So he's looking for actual photos of watermen at work. Um, I personally would probably point you to Digital Maryland, but Vince, do you have any suggestions of where Peter could go about looking for those resources? I think Digital Maryland is a good start because that Digital Maryland, and particularly our site, is in a Pratt archives, Blacks of the Chesapeake. But again, we've worked with the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum. We've worked with the Chris Field on the Lower Eastern Shore. So again, you could reach back out to us or any of those sources, but we do have a rich collection of that material. 
again, I'm still East Baltimore Vinny, and I and I understand the Bon Secure area and Coppin State College that has a, a lot of rich connections to Cars and Sparrows Beach and Annapolis. Uh, so again, uh, we work in the city, in the country, in the mountains. Uh, again, the Chesapeake Bay is uh, 6,400 square miles, 64,000 square miles all the way up to Cooperstown, New York. And so again, we work with not only historically black colleges, Coppin, Bowie, Maryland, University of Maryland, Eastern Shore, but also minority serving institutions, public, private, and home school. And so again, uh, we have a big tent and an open tent. Hmm. Lovely. And um, for you, Peter, I have reposted again the link to Digital Maryland. Thank you so much, Jody, again, who works in our digital initiatives, are sending that along to me so I could pass it along to our viewers today. I've posted that on both outlets. We have time for a couple of more questions. Um, one of the questions that has come through is whether or not um, you're having conversations with any of your um, modern constituents about how global warming or climate change could potentially change the Chesapeake Bay and how that will temper or affect the work that you do talking about the past. Is that something that have you have run into in your work thus far? Well, not only run into, but really uh, a torch barrier in that area. I've done documentary films dealing with sea level rise and coastal change and coastal erosion. And this is what I say. I say that the elders, the griots, the storytellers in our communities are vanishing quicker than the water's edge. So that's one point I want to make, because when I started this project 30 years ago, most of my informants were 70 years old 30 years ago. And I'm just so glad that we were able to uh, rescue some artifacts, capture some oral histories, catch up some stories. So that's one part of it. But yes, we work with EPA and other NGOs around the Bay and around the nation and around the world. Uh, again, around oceans, around plastics, around toxics, around contaminants. Uh, all of it is threatened. But one thing I would say is that just looking at more eyes at the table, more voices, and perhaps we can find better solutions. What I've found in my 69 years and 50 years in professional life is we need to expand people's Rolodexes because people have a tendency of just calling who they've worked with in the past. We really need to open up more opportunities to maximize our investment in trying to uh, save and improve the biggest economic engine, this Chesapeake Bay and the water quality and the quality of life. Get more eyes and voices at the table. It seems like you may have a few of those eyes and voices here. Tim wrote in again and says, we all need to support Vince's effort to make sure this site for a home um, has a home for all the efforts he is discuss discussing. Please stay tuned. Hannah says, thank you so much. Um, I posted asking for any final questions from the audience. I'm just going to give folks um, another couple minutes to write in. Vince, did you have any um, any wrap-up words that you like to, to say while we wait for those um, final comments to roll through? Yes, this is my closeout. What I would say is at this stage in my life and the dollars that I have left, I'm putting more of my money on the fourth grader. I'm not trying to fix or flip grannies at this point. I work as a substitute teacher at an alternative middle school. And I do this for a couple of things, grades six through nine. One, I need to be in contact with real people. I need to hear what the cafeteria workers talking, what's going on in the boiler room. And the principal comes to my office and we put our cowboy boots up on the desk, close the door and pull down the curtains. And also I've joined the Tupperware club. And so I have my little name, my little Vinny from East Baltimore on my Tupperware club, and that's in the teacher's lounge. 
but just to interact, but more equally important to hear what it is on young people's minds. And so this is one thing I would really encourage the viewing and listening audience to do is pour into the young people. I think that we will get a greater return and I would bet dollars to donuts that everyone on this call, on this Zoom, someone poured into you when you were the fourth grader and said, I see value, uh, gave encouragement, put a quarter in their hand or a dollar and just told them they're going to be somebody. That's mm. what I'm the benefit of, that somebody saw value. Even in kindergarten, the teacher told my mama, little Vinny has potential. And when you hear that, it means you're not doing too well. When you, when you tell a kindergarten that they have potential. But uh, that stuck with me. That's great. We have a lot of comments coming in. And no more questions, but lots of folks saying thank you for this presentation. Um, it says, thank you for your work as a GRIO in our community, preserving our legacy and leading this effort. We look forward to supporting you in this work. Um, so great to learn, uh, and especially fond of cars and Sparrows beaches. Um, and, um, says that actually it looks like Nichelle might be a, dis have some descendants or is a descendant of those, the folks that went to those beaches. So that's fantastic. Um, so thank you so much, Vince, for being here today. Um, we really appreciate all the lovely content and are so um, glad that you're working with Enoch Pratt for Digital Maryland. Um, I, if you are viewing this program, I have posted a link to our survey. We would love to hear more about your experience today. If you could please take a moment to answer the questions on our brief survey that will give us feedback so we can improve programming in the future. Um, I would really like to, again, thank Vince for an informative and engaging presentation. I also would like to thank our partners at the Maryland State Archives and the Maryland Four Centuries Project for helping make these lunch and learns possible. Thank you so much for the Hearing and Speech Agency for providing amazing accessibility for today's program. And thank you all so much, our audience, for joining us today because we could not host these programs without you. Um, so with that, we'll conclude our program today. Everybody uh, stay safe and take care out there. Wear a mask if you're out and about. The air quality is not great today. And have an amazing afternoon. We'll see you next month for Lunch and Learn again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vince, and thank you to our audience. Thank you all. Everybody have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.